topic is energy data and behavioral change insights for industrial, commercial, and municipal energy users. We have a great rooster of three industry experts with us today presenting different perspectives. Let's take a moment to acknowledge that we are hosting this virtual gathering on the traditional lands of many First Nations and Inuits and Métis whose footsteps, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. This is an important step in reconciliation. The Association of Energy Engineers is a not-for-profit not for society comprised of over 18,000 members from 100 countries. AE's mission is to shape the future of the energy industry through networking, energy awareness, training, professional certification, and recognition. We're delighted today to welcome Danielle Voss, Membership Engagement Specialist at AE, who is joining us today from Atlanta. Danielle, I would like to invite you to share a few words with the audience. Welcome, Danielle. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, as, he, as Joad said, my name is Danielle. I am from AEE in Atlanta. I am the a membership engagement specialist with um, the organization. And I'm looking forward to actually getting to know each chapter I'm, and all of the chapter members as much as I can. I'm reaching out and attending meetings regularly and wanting to let you guys know as a chapter that I am here for support. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to know you all very well. If you need anything as a chapter or even as just a member, you can reach out to me via email. It's just danielle at aecenter.org. Or you can reach out to me at membership at aecenter.org. And I am glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle, for your welcoming words. It's very good. As a volunteer, Volunteer-run organization, the AE Alberta chapter is always looking for new ideas and support to implement them. To follow, to follow us on social media platform, please go to our uh, LinkedIn page or subscribe to our newsletter that is on the page there that I just shared, as well as, well, uh, as, well as looking at our YouTube channel. We'll uh, now uh, move on into the uh, formal part of our webinar, which is basically uh, a presentation from each of our experts, followed by the panel discussion and a questions and answer session with the audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A section and Tabor or the AE Alberta chapter president will be monitoring those questions and addressing those uh, in a later part of the presentation. Our first speaker today is uh, Adam Long. Adam is a performance coach and electronic engineering technician and technical manager, solutions and innovation at MCW Connect, based out of MCW Halifax office. Adam brings more than 10 years of experience in the building industry and hands-on and design experience in energy management, building automation systems and controls. Adam possesses in-depth expertise in comprehensive solutions, design, as well as data management and implementation, enabling smart buildings to monitor, analyze, and report on building systems performance. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joad. That was a very nice uh, introduction there. Uh, so yeah, I, I, uh, I come from a manufacturing background. Uh, when I turned 16 years old, my uncle gave me a pair of work boots for my birthday, and I went uh, to work in his automated sawmill. And uh, that's really where I got my first uh, interaction with automation and energy management. So uh, I'm just going to bring up the slides here. And as I progressed my career, I took electronics. And my first job was in uh, instrumentation. I always like to tell this story. Uh, I lived in this world where accuracy was uh, within 0.25 of a percent. Uh, and then I went on to this uh, contracting world in HVAC where all the instrumentation was plus or minus uh, 10%. And every time I went to find the data, there was no you know, SCADA system that logged all the information, no paper records of it. And 
you always ended up uh, confronted by these emotional folks because they they tend to take their temperature and humidity uh, settings pretty personally. So that's kind of the aspect that I bring more of a, a grassroots approach and uh, try to keep it uh, open and light. So let me just uh, one second here. So I'll share my screen. This one. So you should see my slide there. Yes. Okay, so MCW group of companies, uh, we're a nationwide engineering firm. We have offices across Canada. So uh, even though I'm based in Halifax, I spend a, a significant amount of my time in the centralized facility management world. And uh, my category is kind of down here, building performance coaching. But uh, we look to fully support the life cycle of building portfolios and energy systems uh, across all of our disciplines. So MCW Connect, I have a little mission statement here I like to read. We foster impactful engagement opportunities between the connected systems in the built environment and the people who need them to run their business. So not only is uh, these data platforms installed for the client, but also for those folks who are consulting and contracting and uh, entering into this continuous improvement uh, data insight action process that we undertake. And why are we doing all this? Well, I like to think about it kind of back to the future. Uh, a lot of this uh, world is, is sort of polluted by marketing. We can see in the movie, they thought in the year 2015, you know, where they were going, they weren't going to need roads. But uh, today, you know, we're still doing manual analysis and hopefully in the future where we're going, we won't need to do that quite as much. So productivity enhancing and grounding the truth in statistical analysis is uh, where we wanna go. But again, if you read the recent study by Memori, there are a lot of players in this smart building space or, uh, what they, there's a new buzzword around it, prop tech maybe. So you'll see, you know, energy efficiency is there, but there's so many other management platforms. I've heard uh, some folks call it uh, platform wars. Uh, so just navigating these things with the client, it's probably where I spend, uh, I, I don't really want to admit it, but more than half my time educating folks on the differences subtly uh, and how they're changing over the last few years. But we all know that uh, it's always going to come back to return on investment. So one of my uh, major resources that I go to is Lawrence Bursley National Labs. And they always talk about that net operating income. How can we influence the resilience of that energy cost risk? So reducing risk, uh, increasing interoperability of systems, while also creating a performance enhancing tool. And that's what gets us onto this uh, kind of predictive maintenance cycle, where instead of just watching the systems degrade as they age, we can monitor, target, and track and report on those and influence the client's decision, whether it is in that operations and maintenance space or potentially on the uh, projects and capital budget side. So what I've learned as I've navigated this space with the client and with the ever-changing software, again, this is another one taken from LBNL, they did a great study published in October, 2020 uh, through their Smart Building Energy Analytics Campaign. And this is kind of the way I like to look at it is, you need to start with the basics, do those monthly data analytics, whether it's Energy Star Portfolio Manager reporting, and then move up from there. 
this data, this graphic I took for, from their uh, site, but for us, we like to start at, at the top and then move our way down, get more complex uh, as you move along in this uh, maturity. So again, you're just trying to create this environment, this energy management information system that suits the ability of the client. And through performance coaching and continuous improvement, we can add layers of complexity over time. So we do that by addressing these main goals. You've probably all seen them before. Reducing carbon is a, is a major topic these days. Uh, but decreasing those operational expenditures as well as environmental comfort or indoor air quality, those are the heavy hitting uh, return on investment pieces that clients are looking for. And then as we do that, we're trying to help them prioritize their maintenance needs. As operational budgets shrink, typically deferred maintenance grows, and they always need a better way of showing to the monetary decision makers, what's the best use of their time? What should they address first? Again, from that study, uh, there's lots of ways to interpret this list, but reducing equipment runtime can be as easy as changing a schedule uh, or more advanced fault detection diagnostics. You can opti optimize ventilation rates. And just to try and, and close this off, uh, because this software landscape is very complex, I'm sure there's folks on this call who have spent time in this space. This was a really good uh, graph that, I, that we took from uh, this study. It shows kind of the difference between creating software specifically or kind of taking a bespoke approach to it versus hiring a company who has experience uh, deploying an expert level system or a diagnostics as a service platform. So I know for me, I would rather be in meetings with the clients talking about completing projects and realizing savings versus talking about iterative uh, programming on software. Uh, that's all I've got for today. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out. My cell phone number's there. My uh, email address is there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, for your uh, presentation. I'm sure uh, people will have uh, very interesting questions for you. We'll uh, move on to our second panelist today, uh, our second speaker, Jason Zimmerman from Rodan Energy Solutions. As managing director, Jason is responsible for leading, managing, and growing Rodan Energy presence in Western Canada. Prior to joining Rodan Energy, Jason worked for Transalta, where he held several positions on top of holding several business development and marketing roles at various technology and energy companies. Jason is a Bachelor of Commerce specializing in marketing from the University of Saskatchewan. Jason, take it away. Hi, thanks, Joad. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Jason Zimmerman. I'm a uh, managing director at Rodan, Rodan West, and uh, I've I've been in the power industry now for 15 years. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna go to my presentation. I know we're probably a little bit behind time, so. So Rodan Energy is a, a, load, a leading North American smart grid company delivering intelligence solutions to power producers, distributors, and large uh, power customers. Um, I'm sure you can probably hear my dog in the background right now. But anyways, um, yeah, the biggest thing about, about Rodan is we, we started as a data company over 20 years ago, and we've been in the data space for that long. And about six years ago, we, we acquired Energent, um, which is more of a data analytics company. For about six years now, we've kind of introduced the data analytics into what it is that we do. Um, 
And so I've kind of chosen a couple of our solutions that are more related to data analytics in the power industry in Alberta to introduce you to. Um, demand is usually a, a large part of your, if you're a commercial and industrial customer in Alberta, it's a large part of your, your bill um, that you'll be getting from your uh, power supplier. Um, and there's two different components of that. Um, if you're a transmission direct connect customer, there's what's called coincident metered demand. And uh, this is essentially, um, it's essentially when the, uh, the province hits its uh, peak demand in, in any given month. So each month there's a different one. Um, customers can implement strategies to try and uh, shed load during these peak demand periods to reduce those charges. And that's where our, uh, our, our data analytics come in. We have a, a peak demand predictive tool that uses various data that we put into this tool. Um, and it essentially gives us this, this predictive tool that helps us to let our customers know when these peak events might occur on a monthly basis. Um, this is just an example of one bill that, that comes from a company. But what this does is it shows you on the bill um, when the highest system meter demand is for a month. And then it shows you how much your uh, total coincident meter demand was for this month. So this particular uh, customer that we chose, they're actually doing 23 megawatts um, during that peak event. At $11,000 per megawatt, you're looking at it's over $230,000 that this customer is going to be paying for, for that one 15 minutes of demand that they are, they're using power. Uh, and there's various... Um, situations or various factors that that influences there's the weather obviously the coldest days in the winter and the hottest days in the summer there's also time of day one thing about the uh the industry in alberta is there's a lot of 24-hour um sites in in alberta so what actually affects this more is home time for the general the general worker within alberta so we actually find that a lot of times that peak occurs during four from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, so as I mentioned, the current bulk charge rate is $11,000, just over $11,000. And uh, this obviously is significant if you're, you're a company that has a large number of sites or that has a large site that, that, jet, that uh, has a peak demand that has, you know, a couple megawatts or more. So this can get quite pricey. Obviously, that one customer I showed you could be $230,000. So what we do is we we do this we take our data analytics and we put it into a report so we we do a daily report and this daily report will just kind of give you an idea of what's going to be happening that day and what's going to be happening for the forecast for the rest of the month and then uh, we also do real-time data analytics as well so we will alert you as the different um the different peaks are approaching so this is essentially what the uh, the daily report looks like. There's a there's a summary at the top. Um, there's a few different charts in there that kind of help you in taking this information to make decisions on what you're going to do with your power consumption for that day. And then as a peak is approaching, uh, we will then start doing real time notifications. So, for example, here we started uh, we started doing the notifications around 98% of when we were at within 98% of the current peak, and so this obviously occurred on January 14th at 12:15 p.m. And then we will start doing reports as it as it starts getting closer and closer. So here's another one at 1:17 p.m. that day, where it hit 99.5% of the current CPD. Um, we also provide you a commentary here that gives you an idea of what you should do from a decision-making process. It's 99.5% of the current peak, but we're forecasting that it's only 97.5% of what we're forecasting to be the peak for the month. So at 1.56 p.m. that day, we hit a new peak, um, but it was still only 99% of what we were forecasting for the month. And then at 9.06 p.m. that night, we would have sent a, a message that said, um, we are now decreasing uh, and you can now go about normal operations. In this particular case, we ended up hitting 98.5% of the forecast. Um, so 
probably later on in the month, we probably did hit the actual peak for the month. But for this particular day on the 14th of the month, we, we did hit 98.5%. So when you use this service, we, we usually, there's the potential of five different days of the month that could be considered the CPD event for the month. Um, and then each time you you need to go down, we're recommending about three hours. So it equals, ends up being about 2% of the time during, during the month. So we've had a couple of customers that have signed up for this that have, that have said we could kind of use them as an example. We had one customer who signed up on September 1st. On September 7th, we hit the coincident peak at 5.15 p.m and they shed 12 megawatts of load that day. So within one week of using our service, they saved over $100,000. Um, another customer, this is obviously the customer that, that lent us the bill because they had 23 megawatts of load at peak. Um, after the first uh, six months, we did a proof of concept for their, uh, for their executive team. And we showed that we were able to save them within the first six months, $321,000 of using the service. Um, so that's the coincident peak. Another, another one that you're going to find on a, on a billing is what's called demand ratchets. Um, and essentially what a demand ratchet is, is when you, when you're a commercial or industrial customer, you sign up for a contract minimum. Um, let's say for example, you sign up for 10 megawatts. Um, but in a current, in a month, you may end up hitting a demand ratchet of 15 megawatts. What's going to end up happening is for the next 12 months, you're going to be billed at 85% of what that 15 megawatts was. So even though you were contract for 10 megawatts, you're going to be paying more like 13 and a half megawatts that you're going to be paying for. So this is just an example. You may we actually have a customer that this that this model fits. They are pretty consistently around seven megawatts, and that's what they're um. And that's what their uh, their billing is. Um, and so then, um, in one month, they they actually significantly, and it happens every year. For one month, they significantly go over what their their um, their demand uh, contract minimum is, and they end up setting a ratchet. And because of that, for the next twelve months, they're always paying quite a lot more than what their uh, their contract minimum is. So this is just an example of the ratchet being set. Um, so what we have is another data analytics that we have is it's not only uh, uh, monitoring the demand for the province, but we can monitor demand on site. So we will give you alerts as your site is approaching its contract minimum. And then at that point, you can make decisions. What are we gonna do from an operational perspective? Is there something that we can reduce our load on so that we don't set a new contract? Um, or a new ratchet and or do we need to do this is it important enough from our operation perspective that it's okay if we set this ratchet and that's basically it um like i said in in the province of alberta um data analytics is a big part of of actually understanding your billing and understanding how best you can save money on your power contracts and on your power bills through through understanding what the data analytics is for for either the coincident peak demand or for your own actual site and understanding the ratchet demand. And that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Jason. Lots of uh, great information there and good insight for our for our audience to ask you questions later down the road. We'll uh, move on to our third and. Not the least, the last, not the least speaker, Baron Bronker, our third industry specialist today. Baron researches energy performance, demand response distributed energy technologies, and electrical vehicles. His expertise includes energy efficiency portfolio and program design, as well as writing technical reference manuals and bench, doing benchmarking financial programs. Barron ha has 10 years of ex professional experience in engineering policy and energy transition planning from his previous roles at e Energy Efficiency Alberta, the Pembina Institute, and Shell. He is also a fellow of the Energy Futures Lab and holds a Master of Sustainable Energy Technology 
from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Baron, the, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Joad. Uh, the first thing I need to do here is figure out how to share my screen because it worked during our test, but now, oh, okay, here we go. Now it's working. Good. So hopefully everyone can share my screen. I, uh, I'm honored and humbled by our illustrious introduction, Joad. Um, so I'll note here that I am wearing two hats as part of my presentation. The first hat I'll be wearing is uh, I work as a lead analyst in the utility distributed energy resources um, uh, space at eSource. Um, and later on, I'll be chatting a little bit about a, another project that I'm leading through the Energy Futures Lab. Um, the presentation I'm giving here is targeted mainly towards uh, utility clients. Uh, so eSource, we work for and with utilities to help them um, realize a, a sustainable future for them and the cities that they operate within. Um, so this, this presentation is, is um, stepping a little bit away from technology and more around the behavioral side of things. So a little bit about eSource, like I said, we work with utilities. We have over 400 utilities and municipal uh, customers. Uh, we were founded in 1986, uh, sort of a spin-off from the Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado. Um, we work in US and Canada. And we, we work in a variety of spaces. So uh, when eSource was founded 35 years ago, we did mostly advisory work, helping utilities um, engage with their customer, deliver the, the types of services that they needed, uh, and especially with a focus on demand side management, energy efficiency, uh, those kind of things. Uh, these days, we've got a full suite of uh, subscription research services. Uh, we do some consulting. We have a, a big data science team. Um, so we do a lot of data science grid uh, modernization um, projects. Um, we also do a lot of management consulting. So we'll we'll do your uh, potential studies and we'll do uh, research on electrification that targets specific uh, sectors. So a little bit of everything. And part of that, we, we host a lot of events as well. Um, so I thought I would touch a little bit on how to translate, you know, the data and analytics that um, I was a little presumptuous about, you know, what, what the other speakers would touch on, which I think were amazing, uh, you know, displays of how we can use technology to, to help the customer uh, save energy, um, reduce their demand and prospective demand charges. Um, so in terms of what to do for driving behavior change, the first goal really, uh, and this will sound a little strange because you'd think the first goal should be energy savings, but in order to get at the energy savings, you got to engage people. So engagement first, energy savings second, when you're talking about, um, in, you know, using behavior as a tool. Um, so the, the most popular tools that uh, are used from a programmatic perspective are, you know, programs that help businesses with their energy reporting and creating very, you know, useful and easy to understand energy reports. Uh, energy Efficiency Alberta, where I worked previously in Alberta, uh, we had an energy manager, sort of on-site energy manager program, subsidizing those types of positions uh, within facilities. And then we did something that was a little bit beyond that, where we had strategic energy management. So it's bringing those on-site energy managers together within cohorts, providing them with coaching, and allowing uh, those managers to, to collaborate amongst each other uh, with coaches um, and sort of a roadmap to energy savings and also feeding them towards energy efficiency subsidies and other programs that uh, Energy Efficiency Alberta had at the time. Uh, activities that drive the customers towards energy savings. So once you've got the engagement nailed down, there are various activities that you can get 
um, folks involved in. And I think, you know, a lot of this is probably going to sound like, yeah, yeah, this is obvious stuff. This is obvious stuff. But I think sometimes it's good to reiterate what's obvious. Um, and uh, I think Energy Efficiency Alberta did a really great job of um, encouraging uh, energy advisors to get in there um, alongside with energy managers. And sometimes the energy manager is an energy advisor or works with an energy advisor um, to look at, well, what the opportunities are for energy savings and what the challenges are, and then developing these behavioral strategies um, that would complement existing programs. Um, so in terms of designing a behavior-based program, so if you're you know, a, a company that wants to design and deliver its own behavior change program, you can do that internally. If you're a municipality, you can do that as well. Um, if the Alberta government decides that they do actually care about energy efficiency in the long run, then they can integrate demand side management and the portfolio of behavior change programs as part of um, what utilities can and, and should offer. Um, Alberta is the only jurisdiction in all of US and Canada that does not have DSM integrated in the utility system. Um, so some things that they can do is uh, as part of a program design, if you are a, a building or, you know, maybe it's a, a school board or a municipality, you can select the behaviors that you'd like to target. So, you know, it might be as simple as thinking about um, preventative main maintenance or running motors or turning lights on and off. Um, you can recognize the behaviors and benefits associated with doing that action the strategies, pilot it, and then evaluate it, and then scale up. Um, key strategies that utilities that we work with uh, use, um, they, 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 they use things like commitments. So they, they try to work with their customer to get them to commit to certain uh, targets um, and, and trajectories. They, they also like convenience. So they try to make things more convenient for the customer. So it's not just about saving energy, it actually makes their work easier. Um, there's other tools, feedback, providing them with feedback on a regular basis. So the energy reports and dashboards do this. There's prompts that like actually prompting. And I think uh, the coincident peak uh, technology that was talked about earlier is a great illustration of this and you can provide them with prompts to actually change behavior and save costs right away um, but also creating a different social norm so culture and, and creating norms around switching light bulbs on and off, or switching the lights on and off in rooms is a perfect example of that uh, the other thing we found uh, and this is from research from ac triple e down in the united states and um, when you do provide targeted information to energy managers, uh, make sure that the information is actually specific. Um, so I would have thought that the, the report on the right would be better because it, it's cleaner, it's less wordy, but the click open rate and read rate that uh, ACEEE found was actually substantially lower for the report on the right. The one on the left, there's specific actions that can be taken uh, with savings and um, you know, source information uh, that really got folks interested. Um, I'm gonna skip this because we don't have a heck of a lot of time. Um, there's some specific information here. Uh, Joad, I'll definitely share the slides here around what works well for energy dashboards. Um, and some great program examples. So from some utilities down in the States, you, for example, you've got Duke Energy in uh, North South Carolina. They run the largest commercial office building gamification program. So this is kind of um, O-Power is a technology company that uh, has developed reports that compares um, customer performance against their peers. So if you gamify and, and instill the competitive spirit in um, customers, uh, they were able to achieve 6% savings during their three-year pilot. This is my contact information at eSource, and I'll definitely share that through the slides.
Um, Jouad, I hopefully I have one more minute. So there's um, a project that I'm leading uh, in partnership with uh, three other companies. Rewatt Power is a local Calgary-based uh, company, as well as Braintoy. Um, Rewatt does carbon accounting and aggregation of small-scale uh, renewables and uh, in the future, various other DRs, DERs, so distributed energy resources, Brain Toys, machine learning company, and then Volta Research. They do uh, online uh, energy efficiency audits. Uh, and then there's the Energy Futures Lab as well. But what we're doing is we're building a digital space uh, where electric utilities can test and, de and develop innovative solutions for uh, essentially creating a cleaner, more affordable, and equitable grid for their customers. Um, some folks here on the call, they might be familiar with something called a sandbox environment, so creating innovation sandboxes. Uh, Quest Canada has done a series of reports on this. Essentially, you carve out a space where the regulations and essentially the rules of the game are slightly different and allows uh, utilities and customers to come up with solutions that would otherwise not be uh, allowable. Uh, so the Alberta Utilities Commission says, you know, you can't integrate and rate-based demand-side management, well, let's put a little boundary box around that, create a sandbox, and let's make it actually happen. Um, so we're doing that, but we're doing it in a digital space where we collect real-time energy data from the customers with real people, like I said, and then work with utilities, um, starting with NMAX actually next year, to, to create um, real solutions with new rate designs, with new programs that they can deliver. So virtually delivering demand site management to these uh, end use customers that are connected to the platform. Um, so traditionally you have a three year program cycle for demand site management. You design the program, you pilot it, you evaluate it, uh, you take some of those lessons learned from the evaluation and you do it again, but you know, you tweak a certain thing here and there, or you scale it up, you deliver it to more people. It's a three year cycle with a big investment. Uh, it's typically a very linear multi-year process. So what the grid sandbox does with that innovation uh, environment, you can rapidly speed that up and collaborate. So you're actively collaborating between the customer and the utility. Um, to deliver uh, pilots and scale up uh, demand side management programs a lot more quickly. And it's not just limited to demand side management. Um, think electric vehicle managed charging, distributed battery storage. When you deliver those types of technologies to a grid and connect them to the grid, the sandbox is able to then test out with the utility how those uh, technologies would actually perform on the grid and what kind of rate designs and subsidies or you know, sticks as well as carrots need to be introduced for them to operate effectively. So that's as much as I'll say on that. Again, I'll share these slides um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about the Great Sandbox. Thank you so much, Baron, for this uh, two presentation in one that you uh, provided us with. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of the uh, participants will like, like to uh, Get more. You have actually the link, the li the web link to your uh, sandbox, uh, grid sandbox project. You can put it in the chat box if you want the people to uh, jump into that information. So I will uh, kick our uh, panel session discussions uh, right now and ask uh, uh, each uh, panelist at a time to basically talk about about their biggest opportunity that they see for the types, the type of service and product that they have been delivering uh, in the next few years. And obviously here we are uh, having an audience across Canada. So Adam is working more in Eastern Canada. So obviously um, we are all connected to some extent, but uh, there might be some regional differences, but please uh, talk about your uh, biggest opportunity in terms of clients, markets, or solutions. Please go ahead, Adam. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, the biggest opportunity right now is just uh, a, a lot of people are excited about reducing energy and, uh, you know, there's lots of information out there, but I would say on the software side, the development cycles have drastically shortened due to the recent uh, need to work from home. 
So everyone is very interested in centralized energy management and facilities management and the amount of data that's uh, being put out there. Uh, I think it's exponentially grown over the last two years or so compared to the, the five years before that. So just uh, on the kind of the thread that Baron was talking about, um, if we could get all of that information into a, a, a single sandbox, uh, some of these innovative companies out there would probably be able to find uh, some interesting uh, things about it. So I think that's one of the, the biggest things that we're missing out on as a country, uh, Natural Resources Canada. I hope they, they realize something like that and they bring together these individual uh, efficiency boards and, and try to do, do more with this information. Absolutely. Thank you, Adam. There's a opportunity and opportunity for more, more cross collaboration. And this is uh, what AE is trying to do through, through those webinar series, uh, sharing that information out so that people can connect with one another and see what initi initiatives are going on. Uh, Jason, I'd like uh, now ask you to see uh, what's your uh, biggest opportunity that you see in the Canadian market and maybe also specifically in uh, Alberta and Western Canada. Yeah, I would say a, a big thing for us is uh, I, I think companies are starting to actually in the commercial and industrial space are starting to recognize that there is opportunity to save money on on their on their bills and on their power bills. Uh, specifically, it like when companies look at their expenses over a year, um, quite often power actually is like number two or number three on their list of um, areas that are the the most expensive for them where they're spending their most money but companies haven't done a lot to to really look at it but also it's a very complicated industry um every jurisdiction has different rules different regulations different uh different ways of billing of billing their customers and everything like that so it gets very complicated and it's often been overlooked um so we've like i said we've been in the industry now for 22 years dealing with the, all this data that all of our customers have and like being able to use the data and understand the data and and help companies to essentially make operational decisions to um where they can hopefully still keep um still keep their their operations going effectively but but also find ways to save money on their bills that's that's kind of where where our sweet spot is where we where we can help companies make those decisions to to reduce their overall spend. Absolutely, thank you very much, uh, Jason, for that. Uh, would like to, now to uh, bring that question to uh, to Baron uh, about uh, the opportunities that you're seeing for uh, the kind of uh, analysis that you provide to utilities and also potentially with uh, large cities that might be owning a utility, for example and how we can uh, impact um, the energy use landscape in, uh, in Alberta, for example, or in Canada? Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, and this is also an area that I work on most of my time at eSource, is um, with the big picture of decarbonizing the whole energy system in mind, is how can we support residential and commercial customers with electrification projects. Um, so uh, there's jurisdictions across Canada and the US where um, you know there's there's the ones that are really out there like in California you've got entire cities that are banning gas um, which might seem a little aggressive to some um, but there are a lot of opportunities to, uh, electrify loads and there's two reasons why you want to do that one uh, renewable energy and other sources of en energy i wouldn't even discount nuclear it's zero carbon right um, at least during the generation side um, and the second reason is if you electrify all these loads a lot of these loads are more efficient and they offer uh, load management and flexibility functionality so there's the 
concept that buildings are no longer just a building, they're part of the um, grid and they're called grid interactive and efficient buildings. Uh, so I think with electrification, there's a big opportunity to really leverage you know, the types of technologies that we've been talked about today that leverage all the data and, and make use of the data. We definitely, there's so much data out there, you need to harness it and you need the technology. So there's a lot of examples of programs in the US where you have a thermostat that, you know, can you can turn it up or down or it can respond automatically based on signals that the utility sends to that thermostat. Um, there's also a lot of utilities that have uh, dynamic rates. So the, the price that you pay for your electricity is supposed to encourage the user to use energy effectively. But uh, as noted, and I think um, Jason, you, your technology is great because it kind of automates that process. Um, once you layer technology onto those dynamic prices, the amount of demand savings uh, at the times that they're needed for the grid exponentially increases. So um, I'm all for electrification because it's clean and it adds a resource to the grid that's actually, you can manage and coordinate um, using technology and the data that we have available now. Thank you so much, Baron. Uh, absolutely great, uh, great comments uh, regarding uh, grid interactive uh, buildings. This is something that uh, is emerging. Actually, uh, myself and my work as a municipal energy manager, we, we are looking at, not that we will do anything about it probably in the near future, but that's, at least it's uh, in our radar to, to, to look in the near future. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more also about our uh, challenges. Obviously, uh, we are talking about New technologies, we are talking about data intelligence, uh, big data, uh, lots of data to manage, and also how to make good use of that as uh, Baron discuss discussed with us, uh, the use of that data, data and transforming it into actionable items and how we can use and actually implement energy savings into our operations, into our buildings is uh, very challenging. So going back to uh, Adam, in your presentation, you had um, a slide about the comparison between the, the software approach to, um, to as a solution. And you, you also had a, this other slide as a, an expert uh, system, which is the approach that your company is offering. Could you go back, maybe let's go back to sharing that slide if you don't mind on your end and, and go a little bit deeper in that. I, th I thought that was really interesting. And I think it's a, it's a great uh, way to introduce that challenges of uh, explaining how it works to decision makers and facility managers. Would you like uh, me to share uh, the slide item? Just let me know. Uh, I think I'm sharing. Is, do you guys see this one now? Yes. This was the one you were talking about, the toolkit versus... Exactly, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so just where we've seen uh, this need for uh, centralized facilities management in the new kind of COVID age, uh, the acceleration of the development of these softwares. Uh, one of my favorite sayings comes from a, a business thinker, uh, Peter Drucker. And he said, uh, there's value in the compression of time. And that just reminded me of, you know, when I had my first job in that manufacturing environment, if we could get the products out faster uh, while maintaining quality, uh, it was just better for the plant overall. So there's another saying that kind of goes along with that. The enemy of efficiency is complexity. And I, I've heard a few people use that one. But if you think about it that way, and I find as a, as a technical-minded people, we always want to get into the 
the vast details of the exact thing that we're doing. Money managers do this, energy managers do this. But if we can just get to this kind of, this concept of a single source of truth or a, a grounded truth in the data, um, it's more effective to the decision makers because you can show them uh, by removing the ambiguity on return on investment and using best practice in energy management, whether it's weather normalization or uh, peak analysis on your electricity use, like uh, Jason was talking about. If you can do that faster and better, uh, it just it it brings the information right to people's fingertips where they need it. But I think that's where we're seeing this shift. You know, myself, I'm uh, I was born in the '80s. My generation was, kind of grew up with technology. I, I've heard uh, one of the thinkers uh, kind of term it as like a digitally native generation, and we're we're seeing that shift start to happen where folks are used to absorbing more information in a lot uh, faster rate. So the closer that we can get to this near real-time analysis, and really that expert system that we see on the right there, it's just building upon uh, some of the things that Natural Resources Canada did uh, around the year 2010. They, they created a fault detection diagnostic platform, Davo, and they, you know, they made an, an, a lot of rules, et cetera. But what we, what we know is that it typically takes a, uh, about five to 10 years to make a good software. But this propagation of software as a service or managed software as a service where these companies have well-developed platforms that can analyze the data and provide that uh, ground truth, well, it, it is worth that initial investment. But I guess pushing through that uh, marketing ambiguity sometimes is people try to, you know, get it down to the lowest dollar denominator. What's the price per point is what I hear uh, quite often when talking about data. You know, how many data registers can I get for my dollar? But if they knew what they were paying for in terms of intelligence and they understood a little bit better what the uh, energy management workflows that are, are automated inside these software models uh, and we present those use cases like Baron and, and Jason were talking about in a way that is appealing to them, you know, appeal to their emotional will to buy, uh, that's that's really what we're what we're trying to get at. Does that kind of answer your question? I was talking quite a bit there. <laughs> Absolutely, you definitely uh, addressed uh, many aspects here. That was really interesting. Thank you, uh, Adam. Um, moving on to uh, challenges that, uh, from uh, Jason's point of view, might uh, be uh, different. Uh, one question I have uh, for you at this point, uh, Jason, regarding challenges and opportunities as well, is how uh, do you transfer the information from that your intelligence system into a strategy about uh, shedding off some loads and how do you develop that with the client? Uh, I'm assuming that could be a nice challenge if you have some very big loads that uh, needs also some uh, very specific parameters are around their operations and conditions of uh, how and when they are used. Yeah, I would I would say the biggest thing, like you're saying, is um, facility managers and 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 decision makers all have like performance indicators that they have to achieve, um, and a lot of times they may be in conflict with each other. Like they need to be able to have, you know, the the best output, the best performance, but they also have an, a performance indicator which is around cost savings as well. And and a lot of times those two are in conflict. And I think that's a big uh, a big issue or a big uh, a big concern for for some of those decision makers. So what we do is we obviously we we try to pr present our data to the uh, decision makers, 
in a way that helps them make their, the best decision that they, they can. Um, and we do have energy analysts as well who can meet with these uh, with the, uh, the facility managers and help them essentially come up with a strategy as to how best to use the data that they're getting. Um, so we don't just present the data and then let them make the decision on themselves. We do have energy analysts that will sit down. They will uh, help them analyze the data, how, how best to use that data so that they can use the proper decision or make the proper decision when, when it comes time to make that decision. Like, um, is this the appropriate time to be reducing our load or is, does it make more sense for us to just keep on going operationally? And there's a lot that goes into that decision. It's not just, you know, what's the demand charges at the time, but, but what's our output at the time? And are we going to um, lose more revenue than we're going to gain cost savings by making that decision? So there's a lot that goes into that decision. And uh, we just try to help them, give them as much data and as much information as they can to make the proper decision. Absolutely, very, very good, uh, Jason, thank you. Um, would like to ask a question also to Baron about how in um, how do we do into uh, integrating or key strategy to improve the uh, outcomes uh, in terms of uh, behavioral change into the energy using landscape? And maybe let's just take the example of uh, Alberta here, but I'm sure it applies to um, to many jurisdictions uh, across Canada. So how do, do we make those uh, behavioral program integrated into or energy strategies, energy using strategy or energy management strategies? Um, you're talking about integrating the behavioral strategies into like, you know, let's say a, a company that that's, you know, a manufacturer or maybe it's, a restaurant or you know, a small office and how, how do we actually integrate those strategies? Yeah, yeah, and it could be easier at the larger level, obviously, does and but say a, a chain of restaurants, right, for example, could be a maybe a, a better opportunity to start with. I think I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna take this one from the angle that there's a lot of great technology companies and you know EPCs and like there's two on the call with me right now that have really great solutions. Um, but even if you have really great solutions, um, there's, there's not everyone is doing it. Um, and so it's kind of the same problem before energy efficiency, Alberta was around. There were lots of opportunities for companies to, to save energy and to do energy management and to run a behavioral program um, that were economic. You know? And so a lot of the, the skeptics that I would talk to while I was at EEA, they would say, well, why do we need energy efficiency Alberta if it's economic? I'm like, well, you just answered your own questions. Like, it's economic, but people still aren't doing it. So, um, and I say this is because you need, um, you know, a, a regulatory environment and sticks and carrots, probably a lot more carrots than sticks, because uh, we know how well the stick works with the COVID pandemic. Um, so we need all of these, these, these programs to, to be readily available so that, you know, all the tech companies that can translate data into insightful decisions and behavior changes um, have the support that they need to implement all these technologies. Um, so I, I, that's why I think with the Energy Futures Lab, Grid Sandbox, all these you know sort of projects that I'm involved in, it's about making sure that everyone uh, understands that. You know, there's there's better ways to do it <laughs> and, and what the government is doing right now, which is the complete laissez-faire opposite approach, isn't going to really get us anywhere at the long run. Like I, I'm a full big on believer in, in like, you know, free markets and all that, but you can have a free market that is, you know, properly supported and regulated, in my opinion. Sorry, I kind of like took the opportunity <laughs> to 
talk about this in a little bit big, bigger picture. It, it's good to share your, your opinion and perspective on that, uh, Baron. Thank you for so much. Uh, we, we also understand uh, all of us, uh, most of us, at least uh, on the call, realize that uh, it was mentioned before, too much information sometimes make it uh, not actionable because we are overwhelmed. So, so, so bringing down to simple, a simple approach, uh, either through uh, regulatory or um, a culture, I would say, a culture of uh, energy um, consciousness about how we use energy and the impact it has is, uh, is very important and we are here to, to build that culture together. Uh, if anyone has uh, questions for our panelists, please uh, put them in the, the uh, Q&A box. I, at the moment, I don't see any. I, I'm sure that uh, Tabor has been, um, have had probably some uh, burning questions uh, maybe you want to jump in the uh, table with a question. Otherwise, I have two more to ask for penalties. And to be honest, I mean, you guys have done a really good job covering most of the items um, that I had on my list for questions already. So I, I'll try to come up with one, uh, a new one, I guess, as uh, you go through your next two questions, Shreve. If that works, yeah, I, the, you guys uh, have done a good job so far. So hard to, hard to find something, but... Again, okay, I'll, I'll continue on with our, our next uh, few um, questions. So, so in terms of um, approaching a decision maker, so um, I will talk from my, my personal experience here in my role as an energy manager for a municipality. So, so obviously, uh, we we do. I do the analysis. I do the. I see the business case, and now it comes to investment decisions, and also, it's not often just money. Obviously, it's about uh, how we. I use the resources around myself to implement projects because sometimes impl project implementation is a, a big part of the challenges. So we have to fit that in the a busy schedule. So how do you basically uh, sell the business case for your service to a decision maker? So who wants to, uh, to start this uh, question? You can talk in terms of... Uh, your uh, key selling points, you can talk about your approach or how you convince a decision maker to go ahead with the solutions, a uh, solution that you propose. That is, as we said, cost-effective. I see that Adam, you're uh, ready to uh, jump in. I've been hitting the lead off all day here, so uh, I, I guess I'll take that one first again. Uh, it really depends on the market segment. We all know this, um, but really, I, I guess you have to find out what what it is that they have uh, in their past experience, maybe that that's dogged them, or uh, where the friction is on, on getting those those funds kind of freed up. I know in the in the private sector, we, we see a lot of movement now with uh, ESG or GRES type reporting uh, for investment. Uh, a lot of uh, banks now are asking companies about how they evaluate themselves from the environment and sustainability point of view. Uh, so just getting the data and, and reporting on that uh, sometimes is a friction point for a publicly traded uh, a company, uh, but appealing to them just by, I think what works best is it is having them realize that they should do it because it's the right thing to do for the environment. Uh, and yes, the result is might be a little bit murky, or it might muddy the waters a bit to to tell them that you know you're you're two or three years away from uh, having tangible, uh, statistically verified results. Uh, but still, uh, getting them to, to take that journey is the important part. Uh, this is not like one of these little, these things that you do in three months and, and you, you just stop doing it. It's a, it's a habit forming. And to get them to convince to do that, I, I think you have, to, you have to build that trust and, and use the, your tools as a, as a form of creating that transparency. That's what you're selling. 
Absolutely, uh, great comments, uh, Adam. Moving from uh, individual projects to a program and strategy, right? That's uh, often the challenge for uh, many organizations to look at energy use and now uh, really much part of the conversation, carbon reductions uh, as part of a long-term strategy. Uh, Jason, maybe you have some uh, comments to, to add to that, to how you approach a potential client about uh, making, the, making the case for uh, in data and energy intelligence services. Yeah, basically, for for me, what I what I think is 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 knowledge is power, and I I think a, a lot of companies out there are now looking for, you know, how do, how do we get more information to make the appropriate decisions for for us from an operational perspective, and so we we basically talk about you know the uniqueness of the of the data and the uh, services that we provide, and that. Um, you know, there's not there's not a lot of other companies that actually provide this sort of data to help you help you make those decisions. But but I, I just feel like um, in today's day and age of uh, you know the information that just the more information that we can be providing to our customers, the better. Absolutely, uh, thank you, Jason. And I'll uh, move on to. Uh, Baron, here it, here you can maybe talk in terms of the two projects as you presented either well obviously the the company you work with and the energy futures lab project that you presented to us about how you build the case for for, for seeing more of those uh, solutions and projects yeah well i think the grid sandbox um i think is a good example of you know, the, the challenge the challenge with uh, all the targets that have been set for you know we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent 50 percent whatever all the and and the technology that we're currently installing some of it is going to be around for 15 20 years um, or more uh, a building that we build now will be around for 50 years um, so um, the the ability to use the data and the technology that we have and so the grid sandbox is built with machine learning and algorithms that quickly do energy audits with all the big data that's out there and tied in directly with the smart meter those kind of solutions can radically um, reduce the timeline for um, testing solutions and, and scaling them up, um, which I think is necessary because if you do one three-year pilot and then you do another three-year pilot and every time you scale it up, by the time that you've actually scaled up the solution, it's like 10 years later. And we need to, you know, we need to do everything like basically in, in a fraction of that time. Um, so that I think that's one of the, the key advantages of all the, you know, the buzzwords that are going around around machine learning, AI, big data, blah, 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 blah. You, you definitely need a smart grid. And so the, the key there is advanced metering infrastructure, AMI. That's typically how it's being referred to. Um, but I wanted to touch on something completely different, actually, because when I was at Shell, um, one of the things that I think the company did really well at the time that I was there um, was how they treated sustainability. So there's companies out there where they have a sustainability person uh, or like maybe it's a, a, a team um, and then they just kind of do their thing and, and hopefully whatever that they plan and strategize works. But at Shell, every team had a sustainability coordinator. So it's kind of just embedded in the entire operation. So if you can embed um, the culture and the norms and sort of the practices of sustainability across the whole organization, um, that's way more effective than trying to impose something from, you know, one sustainability coordinator who's just kind of like operating off the side of their desk or, a, a team, even if it's a team, um, that team is only so useful if they don't have 
support and if they're not integrated with all the other teams in the company. So I thought that was a really great way of treating sustainability while I was at Shell. Thank you so much for uh, this great example, Baron, that gives us a, a great insight into uh, concluding our webinar here today. We discussed a uh, very interesting thing about things about technology, uh, lots of data that we are uh, learning to use more and more and uh, transforming, that, transforming that data into uh, actionable items so that we can definitely reduce our emissions as part of a, a long-term strategy. Uh, some uh, slides, just one slide that I wanted to share, we haven't discussed, I'm uh, sharing my screen here. So we have also uh, partners and uh, sponsors uh, at AE Alberta, the Alberta chapter. We have the uh, Canadian Institute for Energy Training, Solar Alberta, and the uh, Alberta Energy Efficiency Alliance that we are uh, very proud to be partnering with these um, organizations. And also we have a coming presentation webinar in a month from now on December 2nd. It will be, uh, we will be focusing on technical tools for building controls, optimizations, and energy savings. That is obviously part of our three webinar series on building energy analytics. I really want to thank our, our speakers today, Adam Long from MCW Connect, uh, Jason Zimmerman from Rodan Energy Solutions, and Baron Gronkers from uh, the Grid Sandbox project and as well as eSource. The eSource, that was a great uh, introduction. Uh, and actually, we wish we could go more in depth into this topic, but it was really interesting to, to get your insight and your expertise.